Hello and welcome to Connecting Hawaii Business on ThinkTech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, owner of Kathleen Lee Consulting, and I am your host for this program. ThinkTech Hawaii is currently live streamed on thinktechhawaii.com as well as on ThinkTech Hawaii's YouTube and Facebook pages. And if you, for viewers out there, if you have any questions during the show that you would like to ask us, me and our guests, you can email them to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Now that we've had that intro out of the way, I am super excited to have our guest on the show. We are going to be talking about manifesting money in our lives. And my guest today is Diana Gremion. She is the author of Manifest Your Dreams. So Diana, thank you for being on the show today. Oh, Kathleen, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So um, I absolutely love your bio. You have been um, you've advised billion dollar deals for Fortune 500 companies. You've shared the same stage um, with a lot of people that, that are celebrities. Hugh Hilton, Mary Morrissey, Jillian Michaels, Dr. Phil, um, and all that other stuff. And you're also, I remember when we first met, you said you were also a chef. And part of that experience is that you've cooked meals for President Obama. That's pretty awesome, but I, I will let you go into your intro because it's super exciting to introduce you because of everything that you've accomplished so far. Diana, please let our viewers know a little bit more about you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. You know, I'm really proud to be an international speaker now and author of Manifest Your Dreams, to work as a master coach and an energy healer. And I had a lot of great life experiences, as you shared, but I also had a lot of pain and difficult lessons that I had to learn to get here. And my hope is to shortcut the process for other people so that they can go through the challenges uh, that they may be facing on an accelerated pace and get out of there quicker with a little bit more insight and expertise. So I love to be that expert guide. Um, I love to highlight the excellent things, the uh, amazing accomplishments I've had, but there, there have been a whole lot of lessons behind there that I hope uh, to save people some time and teach today. Wonderful. So tell us a bit about your professional background um, and how you came about to now being a speaker, author, coach, and all the wonderful things that you are doing for a living that you've chosen for yourself. Yeah, so these, these are definitely choices I've made in the last uh, five years, but actually everything I do now is kind of against what I used to do. I never ever, actually the very first time somebody ever suggested becoming a coach to me when someone was like, you should be a coach. I told them, I was like, no, that's a fake job. That's not <laughs> real. Like what seemed real to me was more analytical, procedural, uh, operations-based business because that was where I came from. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, I've, I've had the honor of being able to advise Fortune 500 companies um, in debt origination when I worked as an investment banker on Wall Street way back when. This was actually before the global financial crisis. Uh, was working um, in debt capital markets. Uh, did a whole lot of work um, with my background in accounting and finance um, that really helped organizations uh, to leverage what they had and make the most out of what was available to them. Uh, and when the global financial crisis hit, I found that I had to do the same thing, leverage what I had and uh, find gold or something that I could use to move forward. And so in the global financial crisis, I remember the moment that my boss was losing his job. He came up to the trading floor with, you know, just looking dumbfounded and told us that, you know, he, he had just gotten laid off. And that actually led me to um, thinking, okay, well, what am I going to do? What is what am I going to move myself into? I've been in business this whole time. Do I go to business school? Do I work, do I work uh, for a hedge fund? Like, what do I do? I had no idea. And what I decided um, was to actually listen to a voice that I'd heard that told me, if you go back to school, you're going to culinary school. And that made no sense. I mean, again, you know, talk about like crazy decisions that came out of left field. That one I made no sense because neither of my parents knows how to cook, but there was something about it that did make sense because even after six days a week of working 12 to 14 hour days, I still had energy at the end of those days to come home and cook. 
I would want, I'd be so excited to come home and bake a loaf of bread or see or something. And, you know, like it wasn't even just about eating it. It was about cooking it. And I was like, wow, there's, there's power, there's energy behind this that I can harness and move in, in a way. And I don't necessarily understand it. And because of my past experience, um, I'm actually a 9-11 survivor. Um, and that gave me the experience um, being two blocks away from the World Trade Center on the day of 9-11, gave me the experience of realizing that life is too short. <laughs> life is simply too short for us to not do what we would love. And so in that moment, that seemed like a trash kind of moment where I, was, I knew I, that my job was on the line. I decided to look for some treasure and realize that I had this cooking passion, ended up going to culinary school, meeting my husband, uh, and then we, we made the choice to move out to San Francisco so that we could start to follow our dream of one day owning a restaurant together. So that was our dream. He's, a, he's an incredibly talented chef who's been featured in New York Magazine. He's received four stars from the San Francisco Chronicle when he was the chef de cuisine of the restaurant at which he uh, worked in San Francisco. He's even been on um, on Chef's Table. He, he has a little cameo in there uh, in the episode where he's working for the chef that he worked for at the time. So he's incredibly talented, really creative. And so that was his focus. And my focus, because of my business background, was on the operations and understanding the business. So being a finance nerd, I was all about diversifying my assets. So I wanted to learn a little bit about all these different food businesses so I knew how to operate them myself. And I, I understood what could really work, what wouldn't. So I, I worked, like you mentioned, you know, I worked not just in American restaurants or pizzerias, but I learned Michelin starred. I worked in uh, pastry, all these different forms, even catering, because uh, that, was what, that, that was where I realized, like, wow, this is a space where as a business owner, you can um, maybe maintain some quality of life at the same time that you're putting on and producing high quality food. Uh, and that that uh, experience uh, in that move, so we lived in San Francisco at the time, decided we wanted to take our careers to the next level, moved to New York also with the hope that eventually we would save up money for the other part of our dream, which was to move to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> and so we we did that. We were working in um, in New York for for uh, different restaurant groups. and in that place, I was able to excel, not only because I had the business background that was incredibly valuable to, to the restaurateurs for whom I worked and for the investors that I was working with, but also because I had the culinary background that meant that I could speak to the investors about ROI and, and their balance sheet and all those sort of things, but I could also talk to the cooks about how to chop up an onion and how to turn that into something delicious. And so as a result, I rose through the ranks very quickly. So within a six month period, had been promoted twice. I was, I was soaring, I was ri rising high up until the point that they asked me to open nine different restaurants in two different states, all in the same day. And when that happened, I realized, you know what? Something, I don't know how to do this, I want to do this. And so I, I, I followed it. I, I was working and coming up with procedures. So when you're opening that many restaurants, a lot of what is required is pre-planning, analysis, and ways of making something that works, even in situations where you can't be in all the places at once. So to open nine restaurants at once in two different states, you cannot be everywhere. You need to develop systems, processes that work um, that consider the, the real needs of the people in those various situations. And as I was making all these preparations, I was breaking out in hives, but you know, I could cover that in a chef's coat, nobody would see. And I had foot pain, but you know, I could buy more, more comfortable shoes that had better arch support so that the pain wasn't so bad. And I could even buy a better bed so that the back pain that made it impossible for me to sleep at night I could, I could deal with and move through. But on opening day, when those nine restaurants were getting ready, I woke up and I noticed a huge pile of hair on my pillow. And that was different. That was something I hadn't seen before. So I rushed over to the mirror and noticed a huge bald spot on the right side of my head, right here, at the size of a quarter. But 
I was in the middle of opening nine restaurants. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I didn't feel like I, I felt like I had other responsibilities that took precedence over my health and my needs. So I literally brushed my hair right over that bald spot. I didn't show it to anybody. And I just went on with my day. And I know that there are many of us who've done that before, where we just allow what's holding us back, what, what it seems like a problem, we, we brush it aside because we have to take care of other people in that moment. But I realized on that day, that was my wake up call, that something was really wrong. I shouldn't have been in my early 30s with as many chronic pain and as much chronic pain and chronic illness as somebody in their 50s or 60s. I knew something wasn't working. And so I started to think about what it was that I could do that could be different because now it wasn't just my hair. It was the fact that I literally could no longer do the job that I wanted because the foot pain developed into bone spurs that made it impossible to stand for 12 hours a day as you do as a chef. And so I had to shift my, my plan to something else, to do something else, because I basically killed my dream. The dream that Brian and I had, my husband, of opening restaurants, of being this power chef couple, we couldn't do it anymore because I had ignored my body and broken it to the point that I couldn't follow our dream anymore because I was so busy following a goal. And in that pain and that experience, you know, we made the decision, okay, it's time for us to move to Hawaii, but we also need to figure out, you know, what else happens? Because now this dream that we'd had didn't exist. And so I worked with coaches, with mentors to heal the physical disease that I was experiencing, but also knew that I needed help because I had moved before. I'd moved from New York to San Francisco. I changed jobs before. And here I was still stuck in the same exact position with the same old problems I had before. I knew something had to change. So working with coaches helped me understand that many of the problems, many of the things that seemed like barriers for me up until then, being incredibly shy and introverted where all the jobs I had were behind the scenes, never ever me showing my face or struggling with my weight, all these different things that had been pain points for me that I had str struggles overcoming. I was like, you know, I want to let all that go. I want to start that business. I want to follow my dreams. I want to do what I've always wanted, even though I'm in the middle of a nightmare. And so that was what I started to pursue. And it was in that uh, phase that I started to discover a little bit about, um, a little bit more about manifestation, energy healing, and all these different things. And that led me to starting my business. And now I get to, I get to empower other people. I get to empower other people in business to follow their dreams. And what I get to show them specifically is how to take the rotten, the bitter, the sour ingredients in life and transform them into something that is ethereal, that has so much more depth and more flavor than the original ingredients themselves. I like so that. that's, that's a little bit of what I get to do now. I love I love the food references, but um, again, that was a very compelling story. So I thank you for sharing that. Um, we are going to go on break, but when we return, Diana, you can go delve into um, how you are doing where you are now and talk about how people can manifest money in their lives. So we will be right back. I'm Mitch Ewan, host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy is about following the many clean energy initiatives in Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy appears weekly on Think Tech Hawaii at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We'll see you then. Aloha.
Welcome back to Connecting Hawaii Business on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, and our guest this afternoon is Diana Gremion, author of Manifest Your Dreams. And we are now delving into how to manifest money in our lives. So let's pull up that first photo so people can um, get an idea of what you have been doing since uh, shifting from being a chef to a speaker. So let's delve into that before we talk about people's attitudes on money. Tell us about this photo. Yeah, uh, so actually I mentioned being super shy. Um, the very first time that I had ever shared a story in a, in a life coaching opportunity, like I was, I was getting certified, um, my, somebody overheard the story that I was telling and they invited me on stage. So we, I was in front of uh, about 300 people on stage telling a story this super introverted, shy person, I literally froze like a deer in the headlights uh, in front of the stage, like, uh, um, and, <laughs> but I also realized in that moment that I was meant to share the stories of my life and to help people understand things in a different way. And so that's what led me um, to following my dream of becoming an international speaker, uh, where I get to speak all over the world to thousands of different people sharing the stage with, um, with people who are just way more famous than I was, I am. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, and, and now we're delving into um, the topic, which is manifesting money in our lives. And I, it's a great conversation because you had talked about um, people's general attitude about money. So let's go over that before you delve into how we can go about and manifesting money in our lives. So general people's general attitudes about money that you've observed and heard. Yeah, I think it's something very natural for all of us to have grown up with stories around money. And many of these stories come from a time before we were fully conscious of them even forming. So many of the stories that we have in our lives about ourselves, about money, about what's possible for us, come from um, the time that we're between two and eight years old. And the instances that happen during this time, they actually can become imprinted inside us and, and, something, and become something that we carry throughout our lives. And why I mention this is because uh, what many people find is that even though they're trying their hardest to make more money, it's like it seems impossible. It's like they're always struggling. They're always looking to make ends meet. Um, and they have challenges actually doing what's required to move past. And part of the reason is for some of the beliefs that many of us hold about money. Kathleen, I think I shared with you a story from my mentor, uh, Mary Morrissey, where um, she went to a seminar. She wanted to learn more about uh, money and, and um, attracting more money. And this guy came up in front of everybody, took out a wad of $100 bills. And he said, this, this is money. I love money. And Mary, my mentor, felt disgusted. She was like, oh, how could I have spent money and traveled all this way to attend this seminar? This guy has no idea what he's talking about. But this guy, he read the room and he knew that this was how many of them felt. So he asked, he was like, anybody here feel disgusted by what I just did? And many people raised their hands. Uh, and what he mentioned was, well, okay, so you have these feelings about money. You have some form of feeling about what I did. But if I brought my grandson up here, would you have had the same reaction? Imagine if he gone up and said, this, this is my grandson. I love my grandson. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have thought twice. And I share that story because for me, it was really poignant to the fact that even if we don't think that we have stories around money, we do have some beliefs about money that we don't necessarily hold for other things. Why would it be okay for us to say that we love our grandson and to kiss our grandson on stage, but it wouldn't be okay for us to love money and announce that and, and, and kiss money on stage? All of us have feelings about that. And what that helps us start to unpack is that we have stories around money, about what's acceptable about money, what money means, um, how money behaves for us. And those stories actually manifest in our reality. So if you felt some resistance towards that, if you 
if you've ever felt resistance uh, or thought things like um, that rich people were not good, or if you've ever thought, you know, thoughts like more money, more problems, or money is the root of all evil, or felt ashamed about money, those feelings that we have about money, they really point to our beliefs. And those beliefs are what shape our reality, our results with money. Uh, so I think one of the very first things we need to do is start to realize some of the stories that we hold about money. Where, where is it that we may be subconsciously repelling money away from us? Because if we look at money, if we look at everything as energy, then if we are saying, you know, money is not good, it's never enough, my bank account is, you know, all I have is debt, 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 you know, that kind of vibe, like, if I, if I talk to you that way, Kathleen, if I was like, you're not enough, you know, you never show up in time, uh, no matter what you do, like, it, you know, you're just the root of all evil. Would you want to spend time with me? Of course not. Would you want to come, it you know, into my bank account? And hang out with me? No, right? Uh, and what that's that's the thing about money is that many of the times, the way that we speak about money, the things that we say about it actually will manifest for us. And so we want to be more and more cognizant of where those stories start to pop up. And I think that one of the things that we can do that's really useful in that is recognizing that it's a story, but that it doesn't have to be our story forever. So just because it's a story that we're telling right now or that we've told in the past does not mean that it has to define our future. So maybe that's been true for us up until a certain point. Maybe we've always lived hand to mouth or struggled with money. But as we start to unpack what are the beliefs that we have around money, around being wealthy, if, if we have uh, negative feelings about wealthy people being greedy or corrupt, why would we subconsciously want to become rich if we believe deep down inside somewhere that people who are wealthy are corrupt, wouldn't, wouldn't our subconscious try to protect us from that experience? If, even if we consciously say we want more money and we're pursuing more money, subconsciously there's a part of us that's pulling back, that's holding back because we don't believe that having more money is a good thing. We don't, we don't believe that it's a good thing. You talked about, so we have a few minutes. I'd say we have about seven minutes. You talked about the four step process. Could you go over that um, or just a, a summary? And, and if people want to learn more, they can definitely contact you, but let's, let's go over the four step process in the last five minutes of the show. Sure. So before we go into the process, let's talk about what can happen when you use this process. My, my clients go from maybe saddled with debt or struggling with money um, and in just a few weeks, they're able to start to feel different using this process. And within months, they're manifesting a completely different reality. They have literal proof and a system that they can use that's manageable. Now, I, again, because of my operations background, I'm about practicality. I want to create systems that don't just work for one person, but for, for multiple people that we know work even even under stressful conditions. So this four-step process, I've designed to only take 15 minutes. And within seven days, you can expect to, to feel different. And within 30 days, you can actually start to see a shift in your results. And that's what my clients who've 5X their business or had more money during COVID than ever before in their lives or um, who exceeded this month's sales goals and started working on next month's sales goals already. Uh, that this is this process that they have used. And the first step in this process is gratitude. So it's about recognizing all the forms of abundance. And when we talk specifically about this with money, you know, how many of us feel ungrateful when we receive our paycheck? It's not enough. Ugh, it's like, it just showed up and we don't even care about it. We're not thrilled to receive money. We're just like, whatever, you're still not enough. It's not, it's not good enough, whatever that may look like for us. So we wanna start to apply gratitude for money in all the ways that it's showing up for us. This could mean discounts, things that show up for free, those, those still count as money, right? Those could be gifts that we're receiving, it could be our paycheck, it could be a coupon in the mail. Any of these different things are forms of ways that we can actually be grateful for money. And as we tune our vibration to gratitude for money, we actually are tuning to the vibration of abundance of money. And that's part of what helps money feel more attracted towards us. 
the other part of the gratitude for us is um, in, in the four step process is not just what's coming in, but also what we're doing and what we're putting out to move the needle. So how are we starting to work towards, towards getting more money? What are the things that we're doing to foster and welcome more money into our lives? Uh, so that's step one. Step two is visualization. Visualization is key because the way that our mind thinks is in pictures. So Kathleen, if I said to you, don't think about an elephant, whatever you do, don't think about an elephant, please. Kathleen, if you can do anything, don't think about an elephant. Like what comes to mind? An elephant. <laughs> okay. And do you see the word elephant or do you see, what do you see? An actual elephant, an actual gray elephant. Yeah. So you see a picture, an image in your mind and why this matters to us is because this is the way that our mind works is it sees things in pictures. So we need to create a vision, a visualization, an actual image of us having what we want. Now, what most people do is they say, I don't want any more debt. I don't want any more problems. I don't, I don't want any more bills, no more bills, no more debt. But just like we proved with the elephant, what we're actually calling in in those examples is more debt, more bills, more money problems. So what we wanna do instead is take our focus off of what we don't want and start to figure out, okay, what is it that we do want? And I have six magnetic questions that you can get as a free gift uh, on my website where we start to help you create and figure out, okay, if you want less of this, what does it mean you want more of? And what does that vision actually look like? So you can go onto my website and get that. That's visualization. The next step is meditation. This was one of the hardest steps for me because I thought it was all about what I was doing. It's all about go, 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 push, 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 keep doing more. And meditation is actually the opposite of that. It's stopping, it's sitting, and it's trusting that if I'm living in accordance with these laws where I'm, I'm tuning to the vibration of gratitude, I have a clear image of what it is that I wanna create in my mind, that I've done the work and that I get to relax now. And I get to, instead of just constantly pushing out with action, which is the fourth step, the third step is about also receiving. So it's not just about the output that we're putting out when we manifest, it's also about what we are receiving. And so we can actually create in the meditation, in the me meditation step, we ask ourselves, what's a step that I can take right now to move in the direction of my dreams? And simply by asking that question, we tune our mind to opportunities or solutions that would move us in that direction. And as those ideas come in, we take the fourth step, which is action, which is to write down all those action steps that pop up for us that would move us in the direction of our dream. And then we actually start to schedule them in our calendar or in our day to make sure that we're actually moving forward. So those are the four different steps. And it's by continually making movements forward, but also working smarter, not harder, tuning our mind to the vibration of gratitude instead of the vibration of lack and not enough. Working with visualization, understanding that our mind works in pictures, and if we have a clear image of what we want to manifest, then it becomes all the more possible. Uh, and then again, working with meditation, recognizing that we don't just have to be in output mode, we also need to be in receiving mode. So we need to be willing and able to receive ideas, insights, opportunities, and then take action on those so that we can manifest our dreams. Thank you so much, Diana. Let's pull up her logo to wrap up the show. Um, so, if, and, and again, we could definitely talk to you forever, but um, since we are out of time, how can people get a hold of you? You can check me out at dianagremion.com. So it's D-I-A-N-A-G-R-E million.com. Uh, or you can find me on Instagram. It's diana.gremion, G-R-E million, uh, or on Facebook. I'd love to stay connected. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, again, that was Diana Gremion, um, author of Manifest Your Dreams. My name is Kathleen Lee, and this has been Connecting Hawaii Business on thinktechhawaii.com. We thank Jay Fidel and the entire staff at Think Tech Hawaii for making programs like this possible. We had Haley helping us out today. Thank you so much, and I hope you get to visit Diana's website. And until next show, we will see you then. Aloha.